if you could retain every dollar, why wouldn't you? But if you think about how do you prioritize your work, mm. you would think about those who are centers of influence, those who are loyal, those who are most tied to the mission. Mm. And then of course, you want to think about those who are going to really move the needle in terms of your fundraising goals. All right. Welcome, everyone. I'm so excited to be here today with my friend, Lindsay Simons. Lindsay, you are such an inspiration in all the different ways that you do work around the development sector, but I particularly was excited to invite you to be a part of this sort of donor retention series because I think you understand donor retention in a number of different like intersectional ways as being like a capital campaign master. And so thanks for being a part of this with me. Yeah, thanks for inviting me, Mallory. I'm happy to be here and happy to brainstorm and chat with you about what I've seen work and what we can do to advance the space. Awesome. So why don't you just give a little background to your work and sort of what you focus on and what brings you to the conversation today? Sure. Uh, So I'm a capital campaign, major gifts, individual giving, executive coach, campaign manager style type person. So I've been working as a consultant for 13 years now, working on projects that are capital campaigns, anything from a half a million to a half a billion. And I've also done executive coaching with brand new fundraisers all the way up to the very top senior fundraisers, CEOs, et cetera. And I've been interim leadership of departments. I've seen a, a, the gamut. I used to be more specialized in capital campaigns. Now I'm more of a generalist mm. with capital campaigns as my uh, greatest backbone, my strength, or you know where I've like sort of cut my teeth and learned the basics of mm. not necessarily the basics, but the best practices and the models for how I want to approach fundraising and how I want to support my organizations in doing so. Mm, I love that. So tell me, like when you hear me say donor retention, what is the first thing that comes to mind? So I think about donor retention being, how are we keeping our supporters most engaged? Mm. And so when I think of retention, I think about how are we making relationships meaningful enough that your donors continue to want to invest in the organization, in the mission, in the challenge ahead? Mm, I love that. And what do you, when you think about some of the biggest sort of challenges that organizations face when it comes to retention or, um, the kind of biggest missed opportunities, what do you, what comes to mind first? You know, I think a lot about stewardship slash Mm -hmm. cultivation, like two ends of the same coin, right. Or to uh, uh, the spectrum, right. Where they are, um, they're really about, keeping the donor engaged beyond the ask and the thank you. So it's, I think about missed opportunities when I think about organizations who have had glory days and then they've fallen Mm -hmm. down into a changing tumultuous time. And that's often when I'm called, you know, I'm often called in when there's either a crisis or when there's a great opportunity. It's not usually doing that midline baseline. Usually that's business as usual and they don't need to hire a consultant or call in a, you know, an advocate or expert, expert like me to come in. But when I do look, when I do come in and do an analysis of a space, I often see that what's been missing is a long-term plan that keeps folks engaged at all mm. levels. It's segmented, right? So that there's a division of labor and there's, you know, working smarter, not harder, but that everybody is engaged in a way that feels like it's part of a community and that Mm. there's a network in in, Mm. that's happening rather than sort of, you know, all the donors really loved that one executive director and then she left. And so they dropped off, Mm. right. That's sort of a classic scenario we've seen that can be so painful because Mm. it really looks like all the fundraising is relationship driven that it was exclusive to the relationship as opposed to being tied to the mission. So it's gotta be really that combination of shared priorities and mission alignment, as well as the relationship that nurtures it, builds trust, keeps them connected. So Mm. I think about, you know, if I can just riff and, you know, go for it a little bit here. I I think about like this idea of the mission being the nuclear source that should be the biggest uh, magnetic force that the donor feels like they want to put their money to work for this Mm. cause. And that the individuals are the conduits 
to mm. making that work, to making it run smoothly, to bringing them back, to realigning uh, priorities and making giving and investing and being a partner easy. So then when we talk about donor retention in the field, we talk a lot about different types of retention, right? We talk about like your baseline annual givers. Mm. And we talk about your special events givers. We talk about your major gifts, the individuals, corporations, foundations. Then we talk about capital campaigns, which are more Mm. of that extraordinary one-time investment above and beyond. And in each of those scenarios, we might have a different path of retention or like Mallory, you and I were riffing about different organizations structure, organizational structure, Mm. right? Their business models. Like we think that the nonprofit space is all the same thing because it's all nonprofit. But once Mm. you're in it, you know that there's tremendous diversity in how we raise money and how we engage with our donors and who we're Mm. engaging with. And so um, I think some of this was kind of formed, this conversation was uh, spurred from us thinking about, well, what does donor retention really mean? And why are we why are mm. we saying it's all apples to apples when it's really apples to oranges to bananas, et cetera, because we're looking at totally different scenarios across the field. Yeah. Okay. I love, I love that you're bringing us there because I feel like one of the questions I kind of have about donor retention is like, should all donors be retained? And right. I don't necessarily mean like, should people be excluded from the donor journey or for opportunities to get involved and be more engaged? But I feel like sometimes when we talk about donor retention, we treat like lapse donors or, you know, don't the sort of donor attrition number as like a big pool that's where it's all kind of one to one. And when we're talking about different business models, and I don't mean this in terms of a hierarchy of giving, but when we're talking about different business models, and I think about nonprofits that do a ton of like peer to peer fundraising or, uh, you know, things like that. And so they are, you know, organizing a walk, for example. And so they're raising money for their walk, but through all of their friends and all of their family, not that there shouldn't be an opportunity to further engage those people, but if one of those people lapses, Mm -hmm. that has really different implications than a donor who came in because they're, you know, they themselves were a beneficiary or their family right. member, you know, something like that. And so there, to me, there's like, you know, I'm curious how you think about the relationship between the original donor acquisition activity and mm. the donor retention. And like, if you sort of segment or think about, okay, if, if a first time donor is brought in this way, it's more normal that perhaps the retention rate is going to be around here. But if a donor comes in for the first time this way, we really want to be seeing that retention number over here. I think that your point about the peer-to-peer event base, right? So if you're a national legacy organization, I've done work with the March of Dimes and others like them, where they are highly dependent on their center of influence, that mm. CIO, right? And that person might be responsible for bringing in not only donating, but bringing in other donors, rallying the troops, organizing folks, and really bringing in a a large amount of money that's peer-to-peer raised, that is from many people, but centralized from one person or one company. Mm. And so if you've got different pods of those centers of influence, and maybe it's one, you know, in a hierarchy, right? You have one who's the top pod, who's maybe the chair of the walk, the chairperson mm. of the walk, or, and then uh, you've got the next round that's people who are committing to raising a certain amount. And then you've got people at the next round who are committing to raise another amount. And then you've got others who are just walkers. They're just mm. going to show up and, you know, give their $10 for the bib. And um, all of that is sort of the ecosystem of that maybe one to $5 million walk fundraiser. Mm. Now, if you're chair of the walk, drops out for some reason, that could be detrimental because it's responsible for such a large amount of money and people. And probably that person is a person of influence. So Mm. it's uh, perhaps a corporate, a local local corporation head, Mm. right? And that's that's a a way that we've seen work really well. Did did a lot of work with the walk over at City of Hope and they have an awesome Mm. model there where they have a... um, a requirement that in order to be the chair, not only do you have a give get, but you also must replace yourself. So you have to be help 
helpful in training and replacing the Mm. next person. So in this case, retention of that first person, that chair person is not critical. What is important is that there's retention of that space or that role. So that person then can help to find somebody else to fill those shoes. And then hopefully some of those mid or higher level organizers and centers of influence in their own sphere, they'll continue to be part of your walk and might bring in hundreds of thousands of dollars just through their peers or their Mm. corporation. Mm. And then the everyday walkers, you're hoping that some of them come back um, and they most likely will, if it's a good Mm. experience, most likely people, I mean, people do walks for decades at a time um, in in a row, I should say. Um, not at a time. It's a little impossible. Um, <laughs> but I, I can see that model as like being really important to differentiate, like who is important to retain. Mm. And if we think about, you know, like you were talking about how does somebody come in and if you're working on like a hospital or anything, that's a, you know, an experience where you're having a life-saving or life-changing mm. experience, that person's going to be coming in because their motivation is most likely from a, uh, a deep gratitude for life. Right. And so they have this indebtedness. So we call that grateful mm. patience. And mm. you don't want to be losing your grateful patience because they're the folks who are closest to the center, mm. to the organization. They're the ones who, um, if they have, if they have that level of gratitude and generosity paired, mm. must have the two, um, then they will be very loyal and spread good word, goodwill mm. and the word to others. So then again, they're a center of influence. So what's really important is your centers of influence are retained and they don't mm. necessarily have to be your top donors. They just have to be the people who are giving themselves and galvanizing others to give that mm. I would say are really important to focus on. And then you've got others who might be supportive for a project or uh, for a case for support. And that's where capital campaigns might come in, where they say, yes, I'm going to support the, um, let me think of what would be the best. I, I, I don't know. I'm thinking like right now, I'm just coming to mind the schools because I'm working with a school. Mm. And so some might say this building is really important because my future grandchildren are going there and I went Mm. there or my kids went there. I really want my kids, kids to have a place that they can go to. So we can have this alumni legacy. Mm. Um, but you know, the day to day, they might be like, I'm not involved. I'm out in, you know, I'm in, I've moved to England, right? Whatever. Mm. I don't live there anymore. It's not relevant. It's not my neighborhood. But then when I get called for this big endeavor and my kids still live in that town, sure, I'll support mm. you. Um, that kind of donor is not necessarily critical to retain for year and year, year in and year out mm. giving. Of course, like if you could retain every dollar, why wouldn't you? But if you think about how do you prioritize your work, mm. you would think about those who are centers of influence, those who are loyal, those who are most tied to the mission. Mm. And then of course you want to think about those who are going to really move the needle in terms of your fundraising goals. So what's proportionately important. Mm. And so when you think about, um, the prioritization piece, cause I feel like this is actually one of the hardest yeah. things for fundraisers, right? Because everything feels so urgent. There's so much fear built into some of the different components of showing up as a fundraiser. And, um, and so the prioritization piece, I think starts to get sort of really sticky. And I'm curious, like how you work with your clients on that around, you know, how do they set reasonable and appropriate metrics for retention based on those types of segments or the organization that they are? And how do you support them to perhaps like work through the feelings they might have about that number or just some of the stuff, you know, I've been so, and I'm, you know, I don't know how you feel about this, but it's been such an interesting move into the consultant space, into sort of Mm -hmm. the running a for-profit business. Now in the nonprofit space, we talk a lot about conversion numbers in Mm for-profit and really good conversion numbers being, you know, 4%, 6%, 10%. And I think about how in the nonprofit sector, so much of the numbers we talk about are the flip side, you know, who are you losing? Losing and we don't really, mm-hmm. and I think about the impact that might have on our psyche too. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. and I, I'm curious what you think about that. Yeah, I think, um, well, I love how you talk so much Mallory about addressing what's real versus what's a psychological mm-hmm. reality to you, right? You might, the fear base, the, you know, is it true? You know, asking mm-hmm. yourself, is that real or is that a fear? Um, mm. 
you know, what is the, what is the heart of the matter? What are the facts? What's important to focus on? Mm-hmm. You're very focused on aligning partnerships, obviously, you know, and that's what's most important. I think that we can think about that with fundraising as well. Of course. I mean, right. That's, that's mm-hmm. your whole, um, your business is built on the importance of alignment. Mm-hmm. And I think we can really consider that as we think about retention as well, mm. because we, you know, we can get very discouraged when we just look at numbers and we look at what are national stats for retention, mm. right? Or what are national stats in our industry or of our size? It's better when you start adding qualifiers, right? So if you are a new fundraiser and you just did a Google search, say, no, tell me about donor retention. You're going to see stats and they're going to be shocking. And some of them are really bad. Um, mm. But then you have to think about, well, what was that organization going through? And was mm. and were there any context clues here? And how many organizations are we talking about? The majority of America is composed of nonprofits that are raising less than a million a year. And we're, that's a very different reality than the organizations mm. who are 10 and 100 and $500 million operating budgets. Mm. So I think it's really important that we really just think, uh, distill the data that's coming in, really think about what does it mean and how does it relate to our organization? But I really like to look at history. So what is your historic retention? What's mm. worked in the past? What hasn't and why? And then thinking about where do you want to go? So why mm. would it be important for us to have X number of donors retained and which, mm. in which category as well? And I think that it's, um, it, you know, it's critical to be re- a realist, right? So mm. we can't just say we want hundred percent retention. No, no <laughs> right. That's not realistic. And if somebody's priorities shift, then that's great. Like let yeah. them go and, and invest in what's more important to them. Perhaps they need the funds for their family at that mm. time, or perhaps there's another organization that's really, you know, captured their heart and, and that's mm. good. We should be celebrating generosity. And um, when somebody needs to pause with their giving, then I'm sure that it's for a good reason. And so long as we're getting people in the habit of giving, that's what I think mm-hmm. is most important is making giving feel good. Mm-hmm. And making it feel like this is something we should all be doing at whatever level at, for whatever organization. Mm-hmm. So that's what I think is important about retention at large. But in terms of like, you know, if you're in the office with your team and somebody's saying, well, donor stats, I just read this on AFP <laughs> and this is what they're saying about retention. And, and then you're like, oh gosh, we're way behind that. What should we do? And, mm-hmm. you know, somebody's going to get fired here. No, like that's crazy talk. And it's real yeah. too. You know, I'm not saying this. Mm-hmm like hyperbolically, this, this does happen. And it's, I've been in those meetings and I think what you need to do is just pause there and say, well, let's look at ours. Let's mm. look at our donor retention. Let's look at the actions that we've put out mm. and what we've received back and what are we investing in and mm. how does it, what are the returns? Mm. Right? So let's look at our own behaviors and then let's look at what we might do to beta test it even going forward mm. in the future. You know, so why don't we try you know, with one group of people, a strategy, and then with the other group of like people, a different strategy and be a little bit mm. more nimble. Um, if you're really interested in donor retention, then think about it as a riddle rather than a flat, a flat, you know, stat that you need to either mm. hit or not hit. Right. Okay. I love the way you're talking about this. I knew I wanted to have this conversation <laughs> with you because, um, because you're making me think of a number of, of things, right? So we always hear that statistic, like it's easier to, or it's cheaper to keep a donor than to acquire a new donor. Yes. But I kind of have a little bit of a challenge to that. Whereas okay. I think that I think that's true when we're talking about the type of retention that you're talking about, aligned Mm -hmm. retention, prioritizing the right people, making sure, like doing those stewardship activities that continue to deepen that relationship, build identity, build belonging, all of those things. Mm -hmm. And, but I think when I see, I feel like sometimes I see organizations um, a little bit in this, like either, or category, like the either hyper prioritize acquisition strategies mm-hmm. and completely lose sight of all their stewardship, or mm-hmm. they're so freaked out about their stewardship that they won't let anyone go. And I think what I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, or, um, you know, if that isn't what, is that actually it's like the middle, it's like, you constantly want to be acquiring new donors that you are aligned with. And part of yeah. that consistent messaging around alignment is going to allow you to do that. And actually like cultivation and stewardship, those things are not, they, they are a part of the same, they're the mm-hmm. same action 
in many yep. ways on different sides of the sort of engagement ladder, but they're not so disconnected. And so, um, and so how do we sort of find that happy middle where it's like, yes, we're constantly looking for new people who are aligned with the work that we're doing. We're constantly investing in retaining the people who share that alignment and we're letting go of the people who are no longer aligned with us. And we're not letting that freak us out or suck our energy out in a way that takes us away from the fact that there are plenty of people out there Mm -hmm. who are aligned with us. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. And I, you know, I've done a lot of phone-a-thons, if you will, you know, where Mm -hmm. you're really just sitting down, smiling and dialing. And um, it may or may not be for like a solicitation on the call or Mm -hmm. on that conversation, right? And not, not as a phone solicitation, but where you're calling to do a gratitude campaign Mm. or you're trying to get people to attend an event or uh, whatever it might be. But I always talk about trying three times, leaving a voicemail on the second and third time, sending one email and then moving on. And that's Mm. it. So it's like four touch points and that's it. Um, I think that you really want to think about go, go where they're fish, where they're fish, right? My mom Mm -hmm. always says that go fishing where they're actually fish (laughs) and don't just go for any pond. (laughs) Yeah. And go through the door that's open. I say that one a lot too, you know, think about where there's alignment, where there's flow and energy, right? You know, Mm -hmm. we want to get into our California mode of, you know, (laughs) go where there's movement and energy Mm -hmm. and momentum where people want to be. And then where there's not move along because it's not useful. Right. And I also think about, um, lapsed donors. So I think about, you know, if somebody Mm -hmm. hasn't been engaged for four years, that's really a lapsed donor. And if you've got a new hire, actually, I was talking to um, somebody on my podcast, creating community for good, where we were talking about donor retention and data. And Mm -hmm. we talked about um, Ashley Dittmar. She was great. She talked about a, uh, being a new employee and being Mm -hmm. relatively new to fundraising. And she was just given the task of going through all the old donors and reaching out to them. I think that's a great exercise at some Mm. point, but not every, not every quarter and probably not every year. Mm. And, you know, there could be a benefit to going back and pulling through old donors and seeing if you can rekindle the spark or at least understand why they left and Mm. what they might be driven by to come back. Mm. But I don't think it's worth going in and looking at old donors and people who are not returning your phone calls and not coming back every quarter or mm. it's part of your portfolio, just clean them out. If they're not interested. Find somebody who is, because it's a really big universe. Mm. And we have a lot mm. of people who are interested in doing good and you really do want um, your work to be joyful. Right. And so yeah. if you're just running your head against the wall, being your head against the wall, because you're going to doors that are closed or halfway closed, you're not going to enjoy your job and you're not going to you know, bring the light to it that the donor really needs to experience in order to feel like it's a worthy use of their time and their money. Yeah. I think, okay. There are a few things about what you just said that I just sort of want to highlight. One is that, um, so inside power partners, we use those laps donor lists to do something called the seven day, no challenge, okay. um, where their goal is to make cold calls and get as many no's as possible in, uh, in the week. And the goal is to be building their resilience around hearing no, and to do it in a really kind of like low stakes way. Um, so I think if you're going to do it in any way, do it that way. Um, right. just so you're kind of flipping that script. Cause I agree, like calling, setting that as a to do every, however many months and, and building in your self-worth on your success rate with that list is it's just not good for you. Like it's right. just not emotionally, mentally, like it's just not good for you. Um, yeah. Okay. So I think, I think that's like an interesting thing to think about how you deal with that lap donor list. Oh, and then the other piece of what you said that I do think is interesting is I just interviewed this woman, Vanessa Bonds on the podcast, and she talks about influence and that we have more influence than we think. And she mm. demonstrated some really interesting numbers around what happens when somebody says no. And then they're asked again, like the following year mm. or for a follow-up task. And actually the data demonstrates that people who said no, who turned down a request are more likely to say yes the next time. So the oh, thing I also, so I think you're right. Like if you, if somebody has lapsed for multiple years and they've been asked, it is really important to like, let them go. My one caveat would be like, make sure that they've been invited to be engaged. Yeah 
at all and right. give them that a few entry points. If, if you're coming in as a new development director, for example, and there's this cold list and you don't know what's happened with them. And did we, did anyone ever follow up after that event? Like, you know, those types of things, I think it's fine to create some invitations to sort of mm. test that engagement. And then exactly, as you said, let them go and don't get too attached to those numbers. That's a test. That's an awesome opportunity. I love what you said about AB testing um, and seeing what works, what doesn't. That is such an awesome opportunity to like do a little bit of testing around some of your totally. engagement methods. So I love that idea. And I think um, you spurred my thinking around, I do a lot of training on how to make a solicitation of an individual mm -hmm. that's for a capital campaign, something that's really big and bold. And the part of this training is what's, how do you handle responses, right? Mm -hmm. So there are four responses that we talk about. It's either a yes, a maybe, or a not that much or not right now. Mm -hmm. So you don't talk about a no, right? So it's mm -hmm. not really a no, it's just not right now or not that much. You've got me thinking about no's, right? Mm -hmm. And so no's don't always mean no, go away. I don't like you. You're a bad mm. person. Right. And the fundraiser sometimes feels like so defeated. Mm. Right. And I know you do a lot of work to talk about what you just said, but also I know from the podcast you were on with me and, and some of your mm. work that you talk a lot about figuring out the courage and mm. differentiating your identity from somebody's responses to you in your job and fundraising. Um, so I think it's important to consider when somebody says, no, is it a not now, or is it not that much, or is it not that project? And to ask a follow-up question. So I think that that's a big part of retention is to understand when is a good time for me to follow up? What is a motivation to you? What are your philanthropic priorities? How would you like to see your money move the needle in society or in with our mission? So I think it's talking about uh, having a follow-up conversation and further conversation mm -hmm. to really understand what does that person's decline mean? And then if they say, you know, I've really moved, I have other priorities, I'm giving to another organization, I'm on that board. That's a pretty clear, like mm -hmm. clean slate. You can just say, great, you are mm -hmm. no longer going to be harassed by us. Right. And you can put <laughs> that in your notes and your RE or whatever CRM is. And that next person who comes in can really benefit from knowing why that person has moved on. Mm -hmm. As opposed to just saying, oh, that person said no, let's move on. And then a new person comes in a year mm. and a half later and calls that person. Then the donor's even more annoyed because they've already explained that it's not mm. that they don't appreciate organization, but they've shifted their priorities mm. and now they don't feel like they've been heard. And so you're kind of mm. hurting the relationship twice as mm. opposed to that person. If you're a new person or you're coming back to somebody who's left and you say something along the lines of, um, I realize that you left for X, Y, and Z reasons. I want to tell you about something else that we're working on, or I want to explore your current philanthropic endeavors. And is there any openness to continuing or coming back to our organization? Mm -hmm. And, you know, there are a lot of ways that you can have a conversation that are, um, where if you're very dogged and you want to get back to that mm -hmm. donor, you can do that. Um, but when you have a respect for where they're coming from and you can actually reference it, and treat them like a human mm. and acknowledge what's happened in the past so that you can actually consider going forward. And if they then again say, you know, no, no, there's actually no openness right now, mm. then you close the door or you say, would it be appropriate for me to call you in another year or in six months? You know, what mm. would be appropriate? And if the donor just says, no, 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 then you really need to put that in bold in your database. And if they just say not right now, but call me back in six months, which oftentimes they do, yeah. there's there's a whole new gateway of relationship that you can engage in and you can retain your donors in a different mm. way than what you traditionally think of, which is donor retention is year over year. Some mm. of those donors might be coming back every couple of years. Then if you're actually nurturing the relationship and staying with the organization, which is another topic for another time, mm. right? The importance of, you know, having some continuity in relationships, but I think those are things to consider. Um, really though, I think you want to focus your energy and prioritize those donors who are raising their hands, right? Mm. And they say, I want to be a part of this organization. I want to help you. And mm. so, great. Let's think about how you can be that center of influence or how you can move the needle mm. rather than begging to try to retain some of those folks that are, that we've just worked through, right. That we just talked about that are sort of at mm. the very tail end. Mm. 
Yeah. I think what you're saying is so important. And one thing I'll just say really quickly, and then I have another question related to that is I just did this interview, um, with Francesco Ambergetti who wrote hooked on a feeling. Um, yeah, great. and I, I love what he talks about in that book around peak and end points. And I think mm. what you're talking about here is this end point piece, this sort of serotonin, you know, memory based identity based relationship to an organization is so important. And that's really built over time based on peak and end points points with the organization and an end point is how do they pause their monthly giving? How do they transition mm -hmm. off of giving for a year? That really does cement. Like when we think about rituals in particular too, Vic Harrison just said this, um, on the podcast recently also that when somebody leaves charity waters, monthly giving program, there's a ritual for that, like a beautiful mm -hmm. one. And I, and I think those are things we often don't, um, like take the time to think about like how, mm -hmm. like it is. And, and maybe it is because we think, okay, they're out. So they're like off my mind until I'm right. going to make those lapsed donor calls or something right. like that until I want something else from them, but we don't really right. honor the time that they spent with us. And so I really, really appreciate you um, saying all of that. Yeah. And I appreciate you saying that because I sit on a board where somebody is just rolling off and the exit interview was super positive. And it was, mm. again, like we sort of talked about very passionate about mm. another project that has a, you know, I, I don't want to give the details, but there's, there's a great reason. And it has nothing to do with disliking the board mm. that she's been on. It has to mm -hmm. do with feeling satisfied and complete with her service mm -hmm. and interested in a new challenge, which is beautiful. Right. Yeah. And, and what it would be like for us to then send her a care package that mm -hmm. just says, so great that you were, you know, of service for these years. And this is the things, these are the things that you've done. And, you know, maybe a photo and, and a logo, something, and just well wishes, you know, anything yeah. like that. And maybe you don't have the bandwidth or resources to do that for all of your donors, mm -hmm. but certainly for your board members, you absolutely must build that in because, you yes. know, there's a tight relationship and how wonderful to think about that exit strategy. I'm glad you said that. That's a yeah. great point. Yeah. And I think even if all, even if you just get a little alert that somebody, you know, and you give them a nice yeah, phone call, you know, totally. and it's just, just a really quick thing. Um, yeah, I just feel like there's so many ways to, to honor that because I do think, you know, that commitment to the overall, like giving community and philanthropy community and really inspiring generosity, like that takes us all stewarding well, um, yeah. to continue to invite people and involve people in these causes. And so I think it's, it's such an important thing. I, yeah. I want to go back Very to, true. you know, I just saw this, um, statistic about first time donors have an average of a 20% retention rate. Mm -hmm. What mm -hmm. is when you, I was like shocked when yeah. I saw that number and I'm yeah. just so curious why that is happening. Mm -hmm. Um, and I'm, I, I'd love to know, like, what does that number sort of signal to you? When I think about the 20% donor retention from first time donors, I am really wondering where does, where do those donors come from? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes I think people are activated to give when there's an emergency, right? So if mm -hmm. you think about nonprofits, they tend to be funded at large scale by the masses in mm. response to crisis, right? So mm. if we look at the last two years, I wonder where that stat came from. Do you know how long that stat was? Was that for, is that a recent stat or is it? I think it is. I think decade? it was pretty recent, recent. Yeah. And, um, and it was just saying for, yeah, for first time donors mm -hmm. who had given once in the last year, that's what they had seen in the last yeah. year. Okay. Yeah. So what we're talking about is very very current stats rather yes, than exactly. Yes. Yeah. Exactly. I think that's a hundred percent related to crisis. I really do. Mm. I think that's, you know, the food shortage, the masks, the, um, hospitals, the don't, the blood shortages, the, um, then of course the social injustice and crisis mm. moment that our, our country has come to, um, care about more than they ever have in the past. Um, I think that this is very crisis reactionary kind of giving, and that's what's going on. I do think it's an awesome opportunity to retain donors and mm -hmm. to bring donors back. Right. Mm -hmm. So right now, where we are right now, right mm -hmm. now is a time to say, who was that one-time donor who was a response to the climate, um, at large and how might we 
engage them. I think a survey is something we haven't talked about much mm. in, in this conversation, but I do think it's a highly valuable tool, especially mm. if you're talking about, um, you know, massive numbers of people rather than high level major gifts, individual giving, mm. um, you can easily do a survey that asks people about their philanthropic priorities or about their knowledge of your organization. You can drop in information about the impact of your organization while you're asking questions about what's important to them. So it's both an informational um, messaging piece, but it's also mm. a tool to collect data. And then you can segment and you can respond to their data specifically. Mm. You can hear what they've said and say, you said X, Y, and Z, put it right back in their words mm. um, or rephrasing it or putting it into buckets of like sentiments, right? And think about mm. your data. Of course, I don't um, want to get into that tangent there, but you can really have an awesome um, feel for your first time donors, second time donors. Um, you can create automated systems in Salesforce. You know, somebody gives for the first time and you have an automatic reply that is something like, that's so wonderful you gave. Thank you. Can you give us an information as to why you gave and, mm -hmm. you know, how would you like to be worked with? You know, would you like emails? Would you like a phone call? Would you like, you know, newsletter, mm -hmm. social media? You can talk about, you know, what's their preference for communication and what's their giving priorities. And you can do it in a, you know, three to 10 point survey that takes three to 10 minutes very low lift, very low cost and ask of your donor that can really set you on a totally different trajectory mm -hmm. to build relationships. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I love that. And I do talk um, about surveys quite a bit with friend, um, Francesco as well, but I love uh -huh. that reminder. I think it's so important. And I think the data around surveys in particular was pretty mind blowing to me. Yeah. Um, I yeah. didn't really realize just how impactful of a strategy it was. Yeah. Um, and I think it's also a great reminder about how bad we are at designing strategies around what we personally want and how mm -hmm. that is just so not evidence-based in so many ways. Like, I feel like I don't put surveys in things, even in my yeah. own, when I read that some of those statistics, I was like, oh my gosh, I need to start surveying my audience more. I need to start yeah. surveying, you know, it's not something I do in my business. Cause I'm not a big personally survey person. Like I yeah. get those surveys after something and you know, I'm, I'm sorry. I'm not the one who ever fills them out. Yeah. Um, and so I, you know, and we do this, I think so often in our fundraising too, we're like, I would be uncomfortable with that, or I wouldn't want that phone call, mm -hmm. or I would want it in a text message. And mm -hmm. we do a lot of like non data based mm -hmm. decisions based on like mm -hmm. our personal preference. And I think it's such a good reminder to be like, look at the data. There yeah. is so much like evidence around like what people want and what helps them feel included and a part of it. And it's just so important that we are spending some time being familiar with those things as we design our like follow-up activities. So I really, I really appreciate that. I yeah. want to focus because I have you here and I, we've never on this podcast actually focused on capital campaigns. And I'm really curious about the intersection in some of what we're talking about around um, donor retention and how that relates to capital campaign work. Like in terms of you know, how does an organization know perhaps that they have enough of a secure donor base to launch mm. a capital campaign? Because I think what's interesting, you said this at the very beginning, you were like, I've worked on capital campaigns that are a half million dollars to half billion dollars. And I think that's really important because I think sometimes when people think about capital campaigns, they just think about the really big ones. Mm. Um, and oftentimes I think for, I've seen organizations not even call something a capital campaign when in fact they are fundraising, they do a fundraising campaign for a capital investment. Um, and so I just, I'm really curious, like sort of if you could just walk us through, maybe even at the very beginning, just tell us like, what is a capital campaign as you define it? And how does it plug into like major gift fundraising? Yeah, sure. So I think of capital campaigns as an extraordinary fundraising endeavor. It's extraordinary, right? It's not part of your baseline. Mm -hmm. It's not your operations. It's a one-time big lift. Mm -hmm. It is to do something that would have an incredible impact over time with one sprint and with one major inflection of funding. Mm -hmm. So I would think of a capital campaign for buildings, for endowments, for debt reduction, 
for program expansion, for um, a, you know, a, a, an expansion of services or geography, um, a new vision for the organization. I think of them as being very uh, strategic and to have a greater impact on the organization and the, the folks or, or um, you know, the beneficiaries. Um, I think of them as different because you're, you're not necessarily, uh, how do I want to say this? You know, it's, it's, if you have major gift donors, you're continuing to engage them on your operations, but you might also ask them to increase their giving for this capital campaign, but you're being very clear that it's not a um, robbing Peter to pay Paul. You're not just moving the funds over, but you're mm-hmm. asking people to go above and beyond what they've ever done before. In addition to what they're currently doing to maintain the health and the operation of the organization, but to do a one-time extra uh, large investment. Okay. So I love that we're talking about this within the framework of donor retention, because I feel like one of the things I hear the most about Mm -hmm. how to have conversations like this with donors is, well, if we ask them to increase our giving, their giving, or if we ask them to give for two different things, they might not give at all. Mm. How likely is that? Oh, not likely. Not likely. (laughs) Do you hear (laughs) that fear a lot? Um, that they might not give it all if you ask them for two things. No, I don't yeah, hear that in particular, but I do hear a lot. Um, how are we going to prevent that we're depleting our operational fund? Yes. That is really, mm. really common. And what we've actually studied over time as professional consultants and capital campaign managers is that you see an increase in all giving when done right. So you're going to see your operational funds increase as well as your capital campaign funds get delivered if you're doing this with the appropriate outreach. And something I talk about a lot is the critical element of doing a phased approach and Mm -hmm. being very careful about how you're segmenting your work and making sure that it is personalized and proportionate Mm -hmm. and pledge. So we talk about peace, right? The phase the phase approach, which is, you know, doing one group mm. at a time, the proportionate giving, you're not asking everybody for the same thing. I worked mm. with an awesome organization, the Scandinavian school and cultural center. I want to celebrate them and their, their culture is so different from the American culture. We had a really fun time thinking about the, the way that the Scandinavians think about um, egalitarianism and everybody having mm. a same input and same benefits and um, that they really wanted to focus on getting, if everybody in this group could give a thousand dollars, if everybody in this group give $10,000, right? And so that is one way of approaching fundraising. The way that I like to think about it is so long as if we can do that approach, so long as we have them in steps and in stairs, Mm. you know, so that we're asking people to give at different amounts even in those groups, rather than just if everybody, if we do the math real quick, I mean, I sat down with a church, um, I don't know, 10 years ago, and I'll never forget where the head of the development just said, all right, we have, um, what was it like 1500 parishioners. So if everybody gave just $200, we would raise X dollars. So let's go out and just get $200 from everybody. Mm. I thought, okay, that is like a good math. It's it's good math. You're right. But that's just not how giving works. Mm. And it's really not the best way for capital campaigns. And I think that was a bit of a tangent, but what I really want to focus on is the importance of asking people to give what is meaningful and specific Mm. to them rather than just asking everybody for blank blanket, same amount, because you're going to get people feeling like it's transactional. Our culture in America does not Mm. feed our community that way. In Scandinavia, it works better because Mm. they have that mindset that, you know, we all need to pitch in here. We don't, we think Mm. of what's in it for me and what's the value and what's the ROI. And I want to study this and what's what's appropriate and who else has been giving and how Mm. how much, oh, maybe I should give that much then because I want to be in that echelon, right? So our thinking is very different in different cultures around the world, right? And so thinking about, you know, my, my area is, America. So as I think about that, I think about the importance of asking individuals to give at higher levels than before without taking away funds from their operating budget. And I love the idea of a combined solicitation where you might say to somebody, um, you know, let's, let's go with that school scenario because it's a really easy one where schools are going to have the funded need, the bridge, the gap, they're going to have the end of year giving, they're going to have back to school giving, they're going to have, you know, all sorts of, you know, they're going to have the the dance, they're going to have the cookies. Mm -hmm. 
And there are a lot of times when they're asking their community to give, which is great. But if you're doing a capital campaign, you might talk to those individuals who are asking to give at the significant levels that are really going to be your big rocks in the project to consider a gift now that would then be, um, you know, it would be for the campaign, but also to support the operations at the same time. So you might ask them for $100,000 today over, you know, to be paid over the next five years, so $20,000 a year, and that that uh, 10,000 is gonna go to the capital campaign or maybe it's 15 is gonna go to the capital campaign and five is gonna be to fund all of the asks that we do this year. Mm -hmm. We're gonna give you credit. We're gonna give you tickets to the event and we're gonna give you like, put your name on the roster of donors. And we're gonna do all the things that demonstrate to the community that you're part of this community and you're supporting the operations, mm -hmm. but you're not expected to, um, you're not gonna be surprised. Right. With then, then there's another big ass that comes six months later and you think, well, gosh, didn't we just sit down and talk about this six months mm -hmm. ago? And you asked me for a huge amount for the campaign and you couldn't have mm -hmm. told me that there was going to be pressure and, you know, peer pressure and all the pressure that sometimes happens in fundraising to give again. Mm -hmm. That's when it doesn't feel as good. So if you can treat your donors like investors or like partners, then they respond much better. Mm -hmm. And if you're saying something along the lines of, I'm, we're going to ask you for, you know, these are things that are going to come down the pike and it's up to you whether you want to fund mm -hmm. them or not. We'd love for you to consider this capital mm -hmm. campaign. Don't make decisions for your donors, right? Give them the menu of options. Get, let them know what's going to come down the pike. Let them know what's important to the organization at the time. Mm. Okay. There's so many things you said that I think are really um, valuable. And I think you sort of took us actually into an area of retention that I just think is really important. I think what you talked about, about seeing your organizational giving over time and your capital campaign really speaks to this piece that deeper engagement is deeper engagement. Yeah. Um, and so I really, I'm curious, do you know, are you familiar with any statistics that sort of demonstrate folks who do participate in a capital campaign from a giving, from a financial giving perspective, are they, do they tend to have a longer donor lifespan with the organization overall? Absolutely. Yes. I don't have a stat off the top of my head and we can look that up. Um, but that's, that is something that we have absolutely seen anecdotally and by the, the data too, you know, mm. I've been in capital campaign fundraising since 08 or nine, since the crisis, you know, the economic mm. crisis, which was, um, you know, interesting parallels between then and 2020, but we have seen that when people are giving to capital campaigns, that they want to continue to see the benefits, the fruits mm. of their labor, labor, essentially, mm. they want to see the organization continue to thrive because they have made such a significant investment in it. And so mm. they continue to support it time and time again, through either big events or the annual funds. And usually, you know, a great fundraiser an organization would say when that donor has completed their pledge, it would be a sit down where they're thanking them, talking mm -hmm. about the impact of their giving over time, and then talking to them about how they would like to engage with the organization. And oftentimes it's asking them, would you like to continue giving at that same level? Is that something that you're interested in doing to fund our operations? And if the donor says, no way, that was a big stretch for me after the last <laughs> three years, five years, yeah. whatever it is, like I'm ready to take yeah. a break. Then you just celebrate that and say, great. Well, thank you so much. Yeah. What, what can we, how can we move forward together? We'd like to see you supporting the operations so that you can enjoy the benefits of the project completion. And would you consider X, Y, and Z? So then you just find the level that's right for them. And that's really how you keep a donor. And that's how all boats rise. Because somebody who's been giving at a very high level, even if they come down, they're most likely not going to come down to where they started. Mm, yeah. Okay. I love that. And I wanted to just sort of click on one piece of it in particular related to what we know about behavior, um, mm. you know, especially because we, we really have learned a lot here about BJ Fogg's behavior model around motivation, the relationship between motivation, ability, and a prompt. And mm. so he talked about fundraising in particular, the ability for fundraising is like how much someone can give is really mm. kind of the ability indicator. And of course, how easy for like online campaign donations, how easy it is to give. That's, that's the other mm. side of it. 
it. But when we think about ability from an amount perspective, I think that just really relates to what you were saying before around sort of the customization and that you're asking, you're inviting people to invest at a number that makes sense to them, that reflects that you really understand them, the way they invest in organizations, the type of impact they're trying to have. And so I, I feel like what I hear you saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, but that part of tailoring that number, part of, part of like zeroing in on the right ability level for a donor is not just to make sure that you aren't asking for too much. In fact, it's also really making sure you're not asking for too little to, to, because, because that also feels like very untailored to, Mm. to the way they like to participate in organizations. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. I love that. It's a great point. Okay, cool. Well, I could um, have this conversation for a very long time, but um, can you tell everyone all the different ways to connect with you and learn from you? Um, Thank you so much for um, spending this time and digging into this with me today. Oh, thanks for having me. This has been a great chat. I mean, I love our conversations, Mallory, and you've been such a a great friend and peer to me in this space. Mm -hmm. So thank you for inviting me to talk a little bit and um, share some thoughts. You can find me, the best way for the audience to find me is on uh, the website, lindsaysimonsconsulting.com. And it's L-I-N-D-S-A-Y. Simons is S-I-M-O-N-D-S consulting.com. And on there, I've got a sign up. Uh, If you click on podcasts, you can sign up for my podcast. That's the best way to get in my newsletter. Mm -hmm. Um, And then you're going to hear from me monthly uh, and I'll give some, you know, personal anecdotes and tips and then share my podcast. Um, Or you can even, you can sign up for a meeting that way using Calendly, or if you just, you know, get into the groove of communicating with me that way. Otherwise I'm very active on LinkedIn. I'd say that that's uh, another great way. If somebody wants to get in touch, they can find me at Lindsay Simons and, um, you know, DM me and we can have a chat about what's going on happy to talk there. I have Instagram and Twitter under creating community for good. Um, that's my podcast name. So Lindsay Simons consulting is my you know consulting business. And then the creating community for good is the podcast where I have a little bit more of like a wider, uh, audience connection. Um, those are the best things to do to get in touch with me. Awesome. And I'll make sure all, um, all links are below as well. Thanks. So thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Mallory. This was a great conversation. Thanks for all the great work that you're doing and all the information that you're sharing with the community at large and really advancing our industry for good, for all of us to have a better life. Oh my gosh. Thank you. Um, I know you work hard. You're doing a good service. (laughs) Thank you. (laughs) 